Welcome back, everybody, to the 10,000 Heroes Show. I'm your host, Ankur Shah. Delight. And I just finished recording an amazing interview with a new friend. It's, all, it's, always, it's always a new friend of mine. That's just how it has to be. Ward Hayes Wilson, he wrote this book called It Is Possible, and he's talking about nuclear disarmament and uh, the world not ending from nuclear catastrophe and war. And he, the guy just blew me away, just blew me away, and was totally not what I expected from someone who self-proclaimed has no credibility, no history in the US security infrastructure, no advanced degrees, but has done decades of really disciplined and conscientious research. And finally, I, you know, and he, he shares his breakthrough moment after decades of working on it, had an idea. And it's just a very, now that he's done the work, it seems to me, very simple, very rational, very realist, very logical idea about what it is about our relationship with nuclear weapons over the past 70 years that is so um, dangerous and how we could live without that danger and without the fantasy of putting the cat in the bag, which we all know is never going to happen. So I'm so stoked. I know you're going to enjoy this as much as I did. And I'm going to present to you Ward Hayes. All right, before we really dive in, I would love it if you could give uh, a little introduction of yourself to my audience, because I found that in the past, I haven't done that. And recently, I heard some podcasts where they do that. And I was like, oh, that's a good pattern. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Ward Wilson, Ward Hayes Wilson. Since I was a small child, I've thought about nuclear weapons. And in the last 40 years, I've been doing active work, thinking and working on the weapons issues. Uh, I recently finished a book that um, has gotten a lot of praise about this, which purports to have, which has a realist case for eliminating nuclear weapons. And I'm currently the head of a small nonprofit that is trying to create a grassroots movement to eliminate nuclear weapons. Fantastic. To the point, very relevant. I'm excited to talk about all that with you, but let's follow the script for a while. I know we're both improvisers and so we'll very easily get off of it, but the script that I've done for a few interviews now is, uh, is really about purpose. And so what is your current understanding? of your purpose. My job is to create the arguments that will make it possible to eliminate nuclear weapons. Bam. Okay. And so now I want to go I want to go back to like the the origin of all that because for basically everybody alive today lives under the shadow of nuclear apocalypse. That's all that's that's just part of our potential fate, right? In the probabilistic yep. universe that's like, that's out there. But some of us really care about it. And some of us just really want to avoid it or ignore it or pretend it's not there. And so how, how was that option taken off the table for you? Like, why do you actually pay attention and care about this? When I think it's because, that? I think it's because of my mother. So when I was six, my parents were acting really weird. They had this like tightness in their jaws and they, um, they were serious all the time. They, they weren't laughing and I could, you know, kids are attached by um, a mysterious umbilical cord to their parents, emotions and feelings. And I could sense that they were just really tight. I didn't know what's going on. Finally, I asked my mother, I said, what's, what's, what's happening? And she said, bad man. She told me the truth in the way I could understand. She said, bad men have put missiles on an island 90 miles from the United States. They have giant warheads on them that could blow up everything and they could come down out of the sky at any time. And she was talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it's not surprising that she was scared. She was home alone with two kids. My dad would commute every day to New York and uh, what was going to happen if the war broke out while he was away? And, you know, was she going to get in the car and drive to New York and try to find him in the rubble? Was she going to take off for Canada? I mean, 
it must have been a terribly scary time. Some people have said, well, that's nuts to tell a six-year-old the truth about something that is so scary. And there's something to be said for that. But it, the result was that I became a realist. I'm not a guy who holds a sign in a, on a street corner and shouts. I'm someone who looks objectively at the harsh realities of the world and works to come up with a solution, even taking those realities into account. And I think that that is because, along with telling me the truth, she also loved me really well. And so I, that love gave me the strength to face the harsh realities. Because, yes, I knew the world had really bad stuff in it. But I also knew that there was love there, and that gave me the strength to, to face it, I guess. I don't know. I love your show. It's a great podcast. To a certain extent, I believe that it's everything is mysterious. And do I really know why I do what I do? <laughs> it's, always, so. it's always a guess. It's yeah. always a work in progress. It's always right. an evolution, right? Of course. But yeah, no, that's, that's a really good start. And of course, I mean, having a foundational childhood experience, especially one that's really scary or that involves <laughs> the whole world, <laughs> your world being ended, you know, yes, the entire world being ended. Is yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, yeah, that would make a difference. So um, how did you pursue that? Oh, oh okay. There, well, okay. So here's the second part of the story. So um, I don't know if you can see, but over my head, that's Robert Kennedy walking on the beach in Oregon, in the, or actually on a road in Oregon during the Oregon primary. And Robert Kennedy is a, he's one of my gods. So when I was, um, I read a lot of history. And when I was living in Washington, just after college, I read about JFK challenging people in his administration to walk 50 miles in a day. He found this old thing that Teddy Roosevelt had the Marines do. He reissued the challenge to the Marines in his administration. And then he challenged people in his administration, like his staffers and stuff. The first guy he challenged was Pierre Salinger, who was his portly press secretary. And <laughs> everyone laughed because they knew Pierre was never going to be able to walk 50 miles in a day. He threatened to make the press go with him. I'm getting off track. Anyway, what happened is, Salinger didn't go, but Robert Kennedy did. He took three of his friends and they set out from Washington walking along the CNO Canal by the Potomac River. And they walked 50 miles out towards, uh, and some of them made it all the way. They were walking towards Camp David. So I decided, what a cool thing. That's so inspiring. Um, maybe I could do that. And I thought, I'll tell myself I'm going to do this walk. I'll walk everywhere to get in shape, and then I won't really have to go. But I'll be in shape, so it'll be it'll be fine. But I made a mistake. I called my friend Rick in California. He was poor. It was after college. There was no way he could afford to fly out and do this thing. And I said, Rick, I'm going to do the walk. I'm going to do the 50 miles. It's what, on the same day, Robert Kennedy did it. He said, great, I'm in. Let's go. When do we start? Busted. <laughs> so then I had to go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we called the Robert Kennedy Memorial Foundation and we told them we were going to go and we said, let us raise a little money for you. And they called some folks and we raised a few dollars. But it turned out to be a foundational experience for me because I don't know if you've ever driven for an hour at 50 plus miles per hour and looked out the window and thought, I am going to walk every step of the way back. <laughs> <laughs> we got in cars, we walked, we drove out and in, in uh, along the Potomac from DC. It started at 4:30 in the morning and we walked and we walked and we walked and we walked. We sang every song we knew, we told all the jokes we knew. Uh one guy had to drop out cuz he had bad shoes. It was snowy for the first 15 miles. The the moon went down over the Potomac on our right, the sun came up through the trees on our left. The sun went down over the Potomac, glistening on the water. 
that same moon came up around the other side of the world. And we finally made it to Washington at about, well, it was 12 hours and 45 minutes later. And there was one point during the walk, and, and it just, it changed me. There was one point during the walk when I turned to Rick and I said, you know, if we can do this, we can do anything. And it was just that feeling that, you know, it, it felt empowering. And then, of course, the head of the Robert Kennedy Memorial Foundation was David Hackett, who was Kennedy's roommate at Milton when he was a kid. And David Hackett's not a god in my uh, pantheon, but he's a demigod. He's friends with Robert Kennedy. And David took me for a walk, and he's after a week after we'd done the the, mar the fifty mile walk, and he said he took, sat me down and he said, "Wad, wad, what do you, what do you care about?" And I said, uh, nuclear weapons. And he said, all right. And he gave me, he made me a Robert Kennedy fellow and he gave me a little stipend for books and an office. And that was when I began working on nuclear weapons. And basically I was, must've been 1980, 1981. Basically I've been working on them ever since. Oh man. Okay. I got lots of questions and comments and feedback. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm into pilgrimage. I've done various pilgrimages and I do a lot of hiking 50 miles in a day in 12 hours is very fast. Maybe it was more than 12 hours. Yeah. That's uh, 12 I, miles an hour. That seems like, no, that's too fast. You're right. Yeah. Uh, I, I've obviously misremembered it because we were slow. We had to, at the end, we had to stop after every mile and then, you know, and you'd rest for three minutes and then stand up and your everything was hurting. Yeah. It's a long yeah. ways. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. No, I must have I must have misremembered. But yeah, so at, at least 12 hours, probably probably a little bit more. But that's uh well, that's incredible. Well, and then I I it what it gave me was sympathy for old people <laughs> because Connecticut Avenue is four lanes wide, and then there are two other lanes outside. And what yeah. I found out the next day that my entire hip structure was frozen in place and all my legs didn't work. And if you're not at the curb when the light changes, you're never going to make it all the way across. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. taking these little steps. Yeah. Wow. God, that's incredible. I love that. I love that so much. Pil pilgrimage is just so, so close to my heart, you know, to actually walk. And there's this, there's a suffering about it. That's beautiful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you can't think thought, and you can't yeah. imagine what it's like. I've never, I've never thought of it as a pilgrimage, but it is kind of, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, are you kidding? I mean, you're, you're talking about this guy as a God and you're not thinking of it as a pilgrimage. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> so, so then my, my other question, you know, the, this David Hackett character sits you down. Did you have some kind of PhD or credentials for him to give? I don't you have any credentials. Even now I graduated from college. Don't have a master's, don't have a PhD. David introduced me to McGeorge Bundy, to um, what's his name, who negotiated SALT I, the first arms treaty. I got to meet Brian Hare because David, you know, had all these connections. Brian was the guy who wrote the bishop's letter for the Catholic Church in the late early 70s about nuclear weapons. Um, it was a master class to go around and meet all these important people and talk to them. and. Uh, and start to learn from them. Okay. And then, so how did you use that office? Like, what did you, what did you study? What did you, how did you? So I, I worked, I worked on a report for a long time and then I had to move back to New Jersey and I went to New York and got a book contract. And that was really exciting with a, the company that publishes Scientific America. And I worked on it for a year and the first chapter was great. And then I got totally stuck because what are nuclear weapons? Are they are they a military problem? They're certainly military weapons. Oh God, that's somehow I can't get my Zoom to stop from doing those hand gestures. Sorry. Um, are they a political problem? Because everyone claims they're never going to use nuclear weapons. They're just for deterrence, which is political. Are they a moral question? Obviously, they matter in terms of morality, and I couldn't. I couldn't get a handle on them. I kept reading all the literature and it was like, 
it didn't make any sense. It was like dogs barking. You know, I would read this stuff and it just would sound like woof, woof, woof to me because so I, I was stuck and I never wrote the book and years passed. I did computer consulting for a long time, but at nights and on weekends, I read Bernard Brody. I read Thomas Schelling. I read the masters of the field. I read them again and again. I made notes. I wrote in the margins. I drafted papers. I drafted books. Nothing ever got published. But as the years went by, slowly, and I mean slowly, painfully slowly, I started to figure out what the heck was going on. It started to emerge for me. And in 2000, I had this kind of breakthrough moment in the library at Vanderbilt in Nashville that what I wanted to look at was utility. I'd read a lot of Wittgenstein and some William James, and they're both all about, you know, kind of pragmatic and common language stuff. Yeah. And it just made sense. The problem is about, are they useful? And then I had a breakthrough in 2005, and I understood that I studied city annihilations for seven years. And then in 2005, I oh, suddenly... Sorry. What? That sounds exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, but nuclear weapons, nuclear war is about destroying cities mostly. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. It's just funny that that's like a specific subtopic. Well, for me, it was. And, and I didn't work with anyone. I wasn't, you know, talking to experts. And so I, it was an entirely self-generated curriculum. And so probably a serious person would never have studied city annihilation. But it made sense to me because that's, you know, Carthage is like Hiroshima. Mm. And if you compare the two, you learn things. And one of the things you learn is that nuclear weapons aren't that special because you can do the same thing, actually even be more thorough with hammers and, and chains and fire. The Romans destroyed Carthage more completely than we destroyed Hiroshima with a nuclear weapon. So I had this breakthrough that the Japanese didn't surrender because of the atomic bombings. And, and then stuff started to happen. I got published in International Security. My first article that I ever got published was published in the one of the top three security studies journals in the world, Harvard's International Security. And then um, I got a, the next year, I won a $10,000 prize for the best essay on nuclear dis disarmament. And then eventually I got a grant from the Norwegian government for thousands of dollars to travel around the world. And it lasted six years. And I went to 23 countries and I, 22 countries and in five continents and gave lectures to foreign ministries and churches and living rooms and whatever. And, um, and then it really took off. Wow. Okay. So we, I want, I want to hear the solution because we're we're all dying to know. <laughs> but before that, um, I just want to share kind of two of the ways that I've thought about nuclear deterrence and nuclear disarmament. And maybe you can help me point out a, a flaw in, in this reasoning. So the, the first is this actually came up on a hike with a friend last last week. A guy was telling me about von von Neumann. The one of the architects of, of game theory and and his his whole perspective and and I, th I think he was part of the the Manhattan project and I think famous famously was Dr. Strangelove was I think modeled after one <laughs> one which is a du dubious you know what was that honor yeah exactly <laughs> dubious distinction but so von Neumann's idea was that hey as soon as we get this thing the only way to be safe is to prevent anybody else from getting it. And so we should essentially preemptively or use preventive war, preventative war, I think is what he called it, just like bomb everyone who has any ho hope of getting a nuclear weapon. And that way, we don't have to get into this like deterrence game because we're like the unipolar superpower. But we missed the boat on that. That was like, that was idea number one. Didn't work out so far. Now, now everyone has them. Multiple people have them. And then the second theory, the deterrence, the mutually assured destruction theory, which I think also came out of Rand, was that 
all right, as long as we have similar order of magnitude, or as long as there's a certain threshold of, of annihilation, then no one's going to want to use it because they're concerned about their own self-preservation. And so if I use it and it doesn't kill you instantaneously, if it takes 45 minutes, there's a chance for you to use it and then destroy me. And so that why, and the, and the, the idea, I think, in the, in the popular security imagination is that that's saved us so far. The fact that there are thousands of warheads decentralized among multiple powers is the reason we have not perished from nuclear war. So I would just like to present that as a context and get any reflections you have on those ideas. Well, um, I think there were people who wanted to bomb the Russians before they could build a bomb. And uh, the Russians built it very much in secret. And it, this was before a lot of satellite technology. So you really couldn't tell what was going on in a distant country, um, particularly one with closed borders like Russia, the Soviet Union had. Um, and to me, that's kind of the that's kind of the i don't know it's the it's it's a prime example of the way power can grab you and change you and carry you away because imagine you launching a nuclear attack against moscow and various other places and people dying from radiation and you know, there's a lot of people who live in Moscow and you'd have to kill a bunch of them in order to um, destroy any facilities that might be in the in the city. And uh, and to do that because you had the bomb and you could and, you know, you thought you were good. Uh, that seems like. Um, I don't know, I, I just I don't think that would be uh, something that would be a good thing to do. Um, on deterrence. Yeah, yeah, there's a very common sense argument, a moral argument against doing that. Yeah. yeah which yeah. may be one of the reasons we didn't do it, or it may be well, just we ran out of time. And I think the thing is that the problem with immorality is not so much that you're doing bad things to other people, but that it changes you. Immorality is bad for you. It's not that there's just a cost for all those millions of people you kill. You become a monster, and you know you're a monster, and that's that's bad. So, but um, the thing about deterrence is is actually pretty easy. Um, nuclear deterrent. Most people believe that nuclear deterrence keeps us safe, and they don't pay much attention to it, which is good because if they did, they'd be really scared. Um, there's no question that nuclear deterrence works. Nuclear war is terrifying, and it probably discourages people from launching attacks against us, and they're careful and stuff. The problem is it only works some of the time because we're human beings, and we're flawed. We're fallible. We're prone to folly. And if human beings are prone to folly, and we are, and if we're involved in nuclear deterrence and we manage every step, the nuclear deterrence as a process is inherently flawed. It has this component in it that's prone to failure, us. And it's only a question of time until someone loses their temper or goes crazy or has the most dangerous thing in the run-up to war is always... Um, uh foolish optimism somebody gets an idea how they can avoid catastrophe and it'll it'll work out for sure uh, so it's not a question of if nuclear deterrence is gonna fail it's not a question of if it's just a question of when so we it's, are... a, it's a probabilistic argument over time based based on our our like exceptionally irrational and kind of random nature we're not perfect and we can't be perfect until all eternity. So that means nuclear deterrence is going to fail. And the fact is, it's failed a few times in the past. Failed during the, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. There was a... So, so Kennedy knew that if he blockaded Cuba uh, with so many troops so close to each other that the slightest mistake could lead to just could escalate to global nuclear war. But he went ahead with it anyway. He was not deterred. And uh, Khrushchev knew the same thing. 
the, then, so, but everyone was crazy. So during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Joint Chiefs of Staff moved U.S. forces from DEFCON 3 to DEFCON 2, which is one step below nuclear war, and didn't tell Washington. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Soviets tested a nuclear bomb because they'd had it planned, so they went ahead and did it anyway. So we sent one of our U-2 spy planes over the North Pole to measure the air, to pull, pick up radiation stuff from the, from the test so we could analyze it. But the guy, either the guy or the equipment malfunctioned. And that plane, this is the height of the crisis, Saturday, October 27th, I think. Everyone's on hair trigger alert. Nuclear war is inches away. And the guy flies in the wrong direction 300 miles inside the Soviet Union. And they see him on radar and they scramble MiGs to shoot him down. And we see what's going on and we scramble F -10, F-102s one to find him and protect him. But because it's DEFCON 2, there was a policy in the Alaska Command that all the fighters had their regular missiles removed and replaced with nuclear missiles. All the fighter jets. So the only weapons they had flying as they're roaring towards Soviet airspace are nuclear weapons. So if they'd run into those MiGs and tangled with them, there'd been a nuclear explosion over Russia and almost certainly a nuclear war. That didn't happen. They didn't find each other. But it wasn't the magic of deterrence that kept them from running into each other. It was luck. And actually, they asked uh, Earl Morris to do the great um, documentary about Robert McNamara. Oh, The Fog asked of War. Yeah. Yeah. Asked McNamara, you know, what, how did we get through the Cuban Missile Crisis? And McNamara looks into the camera and he says, it was luck. And that's true. You know, we civilization was preserved. Your, your life and my life were preserved by nothing more than chance. So um, I, I am not, <laughs> I, I'm glad about the deterrence seems to be working moderately well, but it's not, it's not a for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, there's this, there's probably other stories that you know, too, where deterrence broke down and it was something else like luck or maybe an individual conscience moment of conscience that, that saved us. Yeah. 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 All right, man. So the book is called, it is possible. I, I can hold it up. Hold it up. I hate to like crassly advertise. I'm yeah. kind of Midwestern by birth. But... <laughs> He's holding up a book for the audio people. It's called It Is Possible. It's got his name on it. Ward Hayes. Future... It's so crass. I almost want to kick him <laughs> off the show because he's just so arrogant and conceited <laughs> and crass. But I'm, gonna, so I'm look, just going to control my judgment here. It's called, the full title is It Is Possible, A Future Without Nuclear Weapons. And now I want to read you some of the endorsements because I'm a guy without credentials. I'm, I No master's, no PhD. So I, I publish some articles. Some people take me seriously, but why should you take the book seriously? So this is Lee Butler. He was the four-star Air Force general, commander of STRATCOM, which is the joint command of mis uh, land-based missiles, submarine missiles, and bombers, that all the nuclear forces of the U.S., 93 and 94. And he calls this book the most intelligent, comprehensive, and compelling argument ever advanced against nuclear weapons. And here's Oscar Arias, who's the former president of Costa Rica and a Nobel Prize winner. Ward Wilson's book makes me believe that the eradication of nuclear weapons is feasible in our lifetime. And here's Richard Rhodes, who wrote the big four volume uh, history of nuclear weapons that won two Pulitzer Prizes. In this stunning breakthrough work, Ward Wilson brilliantly dismantles the false claims about nuclear weapons that have kept a nuclear sword of Damocles over our heads for so long. Here's Marty Sherwin, uh, also a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, arguably the most important contribution to the debate over the efficacy slash fallacy of nuclear deterrence ever written. Okay, Last okay, Ward. 
I, I'm on the edge of my seat. Tell me the argument. <laughs> the argument is pretty simple. Um, we saw nuclear weapons. They were really big. They were awesome. And we, we went into that awesomeness. We, we got wrapped up in it. We, we started to breathe it and it got into our heads. And the fact is nuclear weapons are awesome, but it's not realism to mistake awesomeness for effectiveness. And the fact is they're not effective military weapons. They're too big and radiation is too much of a problem to be useful on the battlefield. And that's been uh, when Putin was threatening to use nuclear weapons in Ukraine in the fall of, 2000, of 22, the New York Times, the Institute for the Study of War, and General David Petraeus all came out in the same week and said, well, nuclear weapons, we've always said this, but we didn't really emphasize it, but they're really not great weapons for the battlefield. They're, there's a lot of problems. And they're not kidding. That is true. They're stupid weapons to use on a battlefield because you'll kill your own guys one way or another. So they're not that useful in the battlefield. They're suicidal to use to fight a nuclear war. Um, we used to think that you, the US and the Soviet Union would fight a nuclear war. And even though we'd be devastated, you know, we'd still be bigger and stronger than any of the other countries in the world because they'd all been destroyed by World War II. So whichever country recovered fastest would kind of win in some sense. Mm -hmm. That's not possible today. We fight a nuclear war with Russia. China's standing there dominating the world. They're stronger and more powerful than anyone else. Um, we fight a nuclear war with China, then Europe, Japan, India are all poised to assert themselves and assume the mantle of control. You fight a nuclear war today, you'll leave your country devastated, starving, poisoned, and no longer in control of its own destiny. And that's not a formula that anyone wants. So the no good on the battlefield, no good to fight long range homeland wars. And we've already talked about deterrence. Deterrence works great until it fails and it will fail one day. So, so here's the thing. We're so impressed with this, their awesomeness that we imagine that even if we got rid of them, someone would want to build them again. You know, you can't disinvent the knowledge of nuclear weapons. But that's not how stuff doesn't go away by being disinvented. You know, the 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 flip phone wasn't disinvented. Um, dial phones weren't disinvented. Something better came along. That's one of the ways things go away. The other way is sometimes people get all excited about technology and then it turns out it's just terrible technology. It takes them a while to figure it out. My favorite example of this is the Hiller VZ-1. The Army invented it in 1952, I think. Uh, it was a little platform about, I don't know, four feet across and had a helicopter blade underneath. And it could lift a single soldier 15, 20 feet up in the air. It was really cool. It's kind of Buck Rogers stuff. No and they were really excited. They were Levitation platform. Yeah, they were all excited. They were like into this. They were going to develop this. It'll be great. And then somebody kind of thought about it and they realized that, you know, a soldier floating 10, 15 feet above the battlefield would be kind of noticeable and vulnerable and yeah. unlikely to survive more than like, uh, you know, 30 seconds. Yeah. So um, they dropped it because it was cool technology, but it wasn't useful. And that's, that's the thing that my kind of realist review of nuclear weapons has brought me to, that they're really awesome weapons, they're really dangerous weapons, but they're not useful weapons. You can't use them on the battlefield, you can't use them to fight wars with long range, and nuclear deterrence is fatal over the long run. So they look like God, they're awesome like God, but they're a false God. So... It, it makes sense to me, you know, the, the, the part about them not being that useful on the battlefield. And, you know, anytime you try to start a nuclear war with one, you're guaranteed to, you know, mutually self-destruct. So I get that. But the deterrence thing, I understand it's not perfect. And it's, yeah, over the long run, we're, I, I accept the argument. We're, we're guaranteed to muck it up. No problem. But in the short run, like, how do you make this transition 
when an asymmetry, just the game theory of it, an asymmetry would be, it'd be really bad. Like if one, if one nation suddenly was like, hey, oh, yeah. we're, we're done. Oh, no, you, yeah, you don't want to lay down your weapons and expect your noble gesture to inspire everyone else to become good and kind overnight. No, you want, the key step isn't getting rid of the weapons. The key step is destroying the perception that they're godlike, useful, militarily effective, ultimate weapons. Because once people realize that a piece of technology is fundamentally stupid, it goes away by itself almost. You'd, you'd monitor it and you'd have careful, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't just imagine that it would go away. But when people finally realized that biological weapons weren't, were lousy weapons, really dangerous, but, you know, they're going to come back and bite you. How long did it take them to uh, negotiate the Biological Weapons Convention worldwide? Two years. Because it's the problem that we have is the belief in our heads that nuclear weapons are magic, powerful, ultimate. And if suddenly they were, you know, we, we think they're diamonds, priceless. Yeah. And if suddenly they were lumps of coal, yeah. If you're a dictator, you want a weapon you can use. You want to conquer the guys next door. You want to, you know, whatever it is. You don't want something that's everyone says is stupid. The thing we could do to make North Korea the maddest is to declare that nuclear weapons are obsolete and say, we're not going to get rid of any, but we're going to convince everyone in the world. We're going to go on this worldwide diplomatic initiative to devalue the weapons. And, and, you know, Kim Jong-un, he's been making his people starve in order to build these incredible weapons that were going to make him into a king. And if suddenly they didn't have that value. Yeah. So, okay. So it's almost like a branding thing. Are you just like the, the strategy is to make them uncool? I think further, I, I want to ridicule them. I want them to be clumsy, bundle, bungling, blundering, dangerous you know, that the ancient Greeks didn't believe, did, didn't talk about Hercules the way we do. We, Hercules is like a hero. He's the big, yeah, strong one. Totally. They, they love moderation. And so to them, he was too strong. So in, in their telling, he was like this muscle bound guy, clumsy, always breaking things. Oops. And that's what I want to do for nuclear weapons. I want to make them into the muscle bound, too strong, clumsy, breaking things, weapons. Okay. So they, yeah, I, I haven't heard of that approach. That's an interesting strategy, but I want to go back to something you said about the biological weapons. Cause I don't have the, I don't have the background there. So what, what happened with that? Like, I, I thought these were still a problem. I thought people were like worried about people getting biological weapons and using them. I didn't know there's a treaty. Tell us, tell me a little bit about the history of the so development. biological the weapons treaty. convention. So there were they people experimented, worked on biological weapons. They did they did research, but you know as time went on, it they could never quite imagine a successful way to use them. It's kind of the same with chemical weapons. Chemical weapons were used a ton in World War One, but they didn't deliver a strategic advantage to either side. They just made the battlefield clumsy and mucked it all up and guys would die for no reason. And then, you know, the wind would change direction, and blow back on your own troops. And so the cons we always think that chemical weapons got banned because they're horrible. The fact is they're not useful. If they were useful, trust me, war is a brutally pragmatic business and countries basically do what they have to to win. And, and, so at some point in the 80s, 70s, people said, these, these, can, these biological weapons, they're never going to work out. There's no way you can. I mean, look at, the, look at COVID. Uh, you know, some, it, a, a case appears in China, and pretty soon there are 11 million people dead around the world because it just spreads and you can't really stop it. If you were like sending bombs over that were spreading pathogens into the air and the soil and the water... You know, they'd spread all over the world just the way COVID did. And so there's no way to really use biological weapons to win a war. In which case, they're just dangerous and dangerous and useless. So you ban them.
And that's what they did. And I'm, I'm not completely, you know, I've read a little bit about the process, but start to finish two years. Because... But draw, draw the parallel for me in terms of how, if this is a historical example of something that might happen with nuclear, what the term is di disarmament, like how would it, how would it happen? What are the steps? Let, let's let's start with okay. the fact that okay. your camp, your marketing campaign, has worked, and the popular opinion among citizens and dictators is that these things are clumsy and dangerous and useless. Let's wait, wait, wait. Let's no. Okay. Let's let's start earlier than that. Okay. So I, the 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 grassroots campaign that I want to work on is wildly successful. People are marching. It's like the freeze movement from the eighties, and we pressure Congress. It's bipartisan. The Republicans hate are being pressured to get rid of nukes and Democrats, and then they pressure the president. State of the Union, the president stands up and gives a, a speech in which she says, um, nuclear weapons are obsolete, and we're not going to get rid of a single weapon in our arsenal, but we are going to launch a worldwide diplomatic initiative to convince everyone to face reality in the same way that we have faced reality. The truth is, you just can't use them for much. And they're really dangerous. And the U.S. starts it and the U.K. comes along because they spend 10 percent of their military budget on nuclear weapons. And they want to have actual weapons that they can use in case Putin starts to invade Europe. So and they like us. So they're with us. And then India comes along because they still have that long tradition of Mahatma Gandhi and nonviolence and stuff. and they. They mostly built nuclear weapons because they wanted to prove they were super smart. Yeah. And they did that. Yeah. They proved that they could do it. So they're like, okay, we, we don't, because I mean, after they exploded their first nuclear test in 74, they didn't build nuclear weapons until 98. So if it was really a military necessity. What were they doing for 24 years? You know, <laughs> come on. They, they obviously don't care about them militarily. Same with Iran. If Iran wanted to build nuclear weapons, it took us three years. How long has Iran been working on nuclear weapons? Uh, if they really wanted them, they'd have built them. Um, anyway, but that's a sidelight. So, so the U.S., the U.K., and India, they, stall, they, stall, they call some national conferences. Um, there's a lot of arm twisting. The French eventually come along, although they hate it. Um, <laughs> um, the big get is China. When China, when China joins in, then we're really moving because the U.S. leans on Israel, China leans on Pakistan and North Korea, and then it's just Russia. And fundamentally, Russia wants to get rid of nuclear weapons too because there is no other way that you could wipe out Russia in an afternoon except nuclear weapons. If nuclear weapons were gone then Russia gets three months to mobilize. They've got their big territory. You've got to move across it. You've got to invade. It's a much better situation for them militarily than, than life with nukes. And so eventually they go along. And then everyone agrees they're crappy weapons. You pass a treaty. You have um, stringent uh, uh, monitoring. And... You know, it's like uh, biological and chemical weapons now. There's a there are treaties banning them. Sometimes people break the treaty, but you know, um, just because uh, there are occasional burglaries doesn't mean that you can't have laws that outlaw burglary, and that you should you should have laws that outlaw burglary. So just because laws get broken does is no reason not to have a law. Okay, I'm starting to grasp something here, but I'm not I'm not all the way there. But the the idea is that it's not the nuclear weapons that are the problem. It's not the fact that they were invented and we can't put the cat in the bag, which of course we can't. It's it's our attitude or relationship to them and deterrence is always going to, you know, you know, we know probabilistically deterrence is going to fail us because somebody is going to get pissed off and do the wrong thing. And they're, and the wrong thing for them is like, oh, I'm going to mess with the other side. And the default for messing with the other side is this nuclear weapon. And what you're trying to do is have there be another default when someone wants to make an irrational human decision 
is launch some sort of like catastrophic non-nuclear weapon. You know, a world without nuclear weapons will not be a world without risk. It will not be a world without war. It won't be a perfect world, but it will be a world where you won't have to wake up every morning and in some part of your brain, you know that maybe this afternoon, maybe next month, but someday, all the civilization that we built, all the beautiful works of art, all the contracts, all the real estate uh, deeds will just go up in smoke. And we'll be, you know, we'll be just scratching around in the ashes. So, yeah. Okay. I got a question here. I'll, I'll connect this in a second. Do, do you, do you now, or have you ever identified in the past as, as a pacifist? No. Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what I'm seeing here. It's like, in my mind, like the anti-nuclear crowd, because the people I know who have been anti-nuclear activists are really aligned with it, with this sort of like maybe like Christian left wing, really noble, really beautiful pacifism. And they're like, war's fucked up. Violence is fucked up. You know, like we need to look into our hearts and like, you know, it's the kind of stuff that I really love, like the Gandhi stuff. And the, and the new, the anti-nuclear protests are an expression of that. But you're, you're really like coming at it from very different perspective, almost I, from like a general's perspective of like, this is not a good usage of my budget. What I did was I started against nuclear weapons. I heard Helen Caldicott speak. Helen Caldicott is a doctor from Australia who does was amazingly emotional and said, after a nuclear war, there'll be no doctors, people will die, it'll be horrible, radiation poisoning, blah, blah, blah. She's really, she's super powerful. She was a big deal in starting and feeding the freeze movement. Um, and for two years, I said, I'm gonna do it. I'm going to think of the the argument that will get rid of nuclear weapons. And I spent years studying uh, just war theory. And I read all this stuff and I'd pace back and forth in my parents' living room. And eventually I realized that in a crisis, people will do whatever they have to to survive. So moral arguments aren't, aren't going to be winning arguments in a nuclear crisis. Or they might be but probably only in a small percentage. And so I taught myself to be more realistic, to be more, because I knew that those arguments wouldn't persuade generals and politicians and you know, hardcore people. And so the, the endorsement from, I've got two four-star Air Force generals who've endorsed this and I, Four-star army general endorsed the earlier book I did. And um, those that's really valuable to me because, you know, I want to get, I want to prevent the use of nuclear weapons. And I'm willing to even use realist arguments to do it. Yeah. I and mean, that's like, so in, in my in my bizarre, I, I hope this isn't distasteful for you, but in my bizarre like marketing metaphor, like those are those are your ideal clients. Yeah, kind of. Although the fact is the arm, the military are broken into two groups. There, there's a group that really loves nuclear weapons and they've totally bought in and they think nuclear weapons are God. Okay. Um, but there are also a bunch of military people who basically don't like them. I went and gave a talk at the A-10 directorate at the Pentagon. At the time, the A-10 directorate was the Air Force's Office of Policy Planning and Strategy for Nuclear Weapons. And um, there were probably four civilians and 12, 20 uh, uh, bomber pilots, bombardiers, and the guys who sit in missile silos, and me. And the civilians hated what I had to say because their jobs depend on nuclear weapons being important. But the bomber guys took me back to their cubicles after the talk, and we sat for another hour and talked. And at the end, the executive officer said, well, maybe nuclear weapons aren't the deterrent of the future. So their bomber pilots don't want to drop nuclear weapons because they want to be the they want to be the hero. They want to be the guy who finds the target and bombs it that wins the war, the key facility that causes the enemy to be unable to keep going. 
and they don't want to be the guy who drops kills women and children and burns cities and then you know maybe gets home or maybe doesn't but there's no home to get back to because it's a nuclear war maybe some of them like nuclear weapons i don't know but at least the guys i talked to they were really they weren't you can't be ambivalent about nuclear weapons because you lose your job in the air force if you do express any doubts they just take you off nuclear weapons and let you you know do guard duty or something but you could feel that they were looking they liked the arguments i was making they were historical and practical and factual and it was a way out for them yeah I mean, there's also and maybe i'm just stuck on this point i mean that that seems really important also but if i put on my administration hat you know my like bureaucratic general hat and i have like unfortunately because of all the cuts in spending i only have x billion dollars um these days to use and some percentage of my budget is going to a, a weapon that I just can't use on a battlefield. I'm going to be like, yo, I'd like, I'd like to reallocate that to something I could actually use. I mean, so yeah. that, that makes sense to me, yeah. that it would make sense to them. I think, I think, I think different kinds of technologies go away because of utility. If something is useful, it gets adopted. If it's, if it remains useful, it gets used for a while. And when it stops being useful, it's abandoned. And that's the way we ought to think about nuclear weapons, not are they gods? Could one guy with a nuclear weapon conquer the world, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that all the, the apocalypse thinking, I actually wrote an op-ed for the LA Times about the Oppenheimer movie. And I said, I think the movie makes it harder to get rid of nuclear weapons because in a way it builds up the mystique of the weapons. It 100%. makes- It's so dramatic. Yeah. yeah. And it makes them more awesome. And the problem is we've fallen into this awesome, I don't know what it is, mental state or something where it's we're- It's a spell, it's an enchantment. Yes, exactly, exactly. In fact, there's a really good article I was just reading that a guy wrote in security studies called The Bomb as God, a metaphor that impedes nuclear disarmament. And he talks about how People get caught up in this, and he has all these quotes of officials who are just in awe of nuclear weapons. And you know what? There's this great cartoon that uh, Herblock did in the 50s, and it's of a giant bomb man, and he's got a measuring tape that he's stretched around the equator of the world, and he's measuring the world, obviously preparing to destroy it. And there's a tiny little table on the North Pole with a round one with eight or 12 little tiny men negotiating. And the bomb says to them, oh, don't mind me, just go right on talking. And this symbolizes in a way, I think the exact wrong attitude towards nuclear weapons because it makes nuclear weapons big and we're small. And I think there are so many people who think that nuclear weapons will determine whether we live or die. And the fact is, Technology is not going to determine what happens to the human race. We are in control of our own destiny. We decide. And, and uh, technology is our servant, not our master. I think, that, I think that we can get rid of nuclear weapons. I, the more I talk to people and I'm just, I'm optimistic. Well. I'm impressed. I'm stoked. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, no, I'm 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 sold, dude. The um, yeah, the kind of the kind of marketing brand like image relationship approach to it. I not something I thought about before. Well, it's also you could also cast it not just as marketing but as religion. Like yeah. we really there are people yeah. who really do worship nuclear weapons yeah. as the ultimate as god as, you know, and that's powerful, but it's it's a false god. I, in fact, I was at King King's College. I got I took a really cheap flight to London, and I did a couple talks there. And one of them was at King's College, and I was really excited. Afterwards, this guy comes up. It was grad students, and he said that was a that was a good talk. Yeah, yeah. And I said thank you very much. And then he said I was going to join the UK military, uh, the the nuclear forces, but uh, no, I'm not gonna. 
And I was like, wow. First, I was scared. I was like, no, don't change your life just because of what I said. And then later, I, I didn't actually say that. But then later, I thought, well, actually, Ward, that is what you should be going for. You want to change the world. You do want to change people's ideas about what's important to do. So amazing. So I, th I think what we really need here, the next step is to get you on like a real podcast. <laughs> no, this is a real podcast. Come on. No, no, it's cool. Like I really, I enjoy this. I think we're doing good work here, but this, I'm just putting this out as a call to the audience. Like if we can get, if we can get you on like Joe Rogan or Sam Harris, or I don't, I don't know a lot about what the popular ones are these days, but yeah, Sam Harris is really into good? nuclear. Yeah. Sam Harris is really into nuclear weapons. Into, uh, into talking he, about it or just into promoting it or. He had a guy on who's really against them and he was feeding him lines and stuff. He, he wants to have an argument like this, but I haven't written to him yet because I don't know, you get one shot. So. I'm trying to I'm trying to make sure my podcast um, thing is good and well honed. I'm practicing a little bit. You're ready. I mean, I'm not I'm not a tough client because I don't have a lot of background in it, so I, I can only bring what I can bring. But uh, but you're ready. You're awesome. Well, I, I'm not worried about the technical arguments. I debated Sir Lawrence Friedman, who wrote the Evolution of Nuclear Strategy, and is the guy in in the UK. And uh, in 2013, and um, it was not a problem. Ooh, oh, sick burn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he's a smart guy. He's a he's the best historian on this issue, but he's fully bought into the myth. And yeah. once you step out of it, it gives you a whole different perspective. And you know, so. I mean, uh, so uh, um, I was invited to go to the Cambridge Union, which was debating nuclear weapons. And they had, and the proposition was, this house believes that nuclear weapons have made the world safer. And uh, there were three of us on each team and we each had 10 minutes. And I didn't realize that all the labor kids, the ones who are um, liberal and progressive and stuff, go and join clubs where they're actually saving the world. And it's the Tories, the conservatives who joined the Cambridge Union because they want to be prime minister one day. So the, the audience was fundamentally more conservative, tilting conservative. And then um, they didn't tell me that it was black tie. It was a fancy dinner. And then we debated. And so I'm like the ugly American in a gray suit and everybody else is, you know. Which is just inevitable, really. I mean, British and proper and more charming than I am. And, you know, the whole thing. And, uh, and they did a straw poll before the debate, and there was a clear majority in favor of the proposition. And we crushed them. The final vote was 171 votes against, 55 in favor, 38 abstentions, more than three to one margin. Damn. So. And, and that, that's what I think that's really beautiful about your approach, Ward, is that it's not it does not rely on traditional values from one ideology or another. It's not, it's not based on that really beautiful pacifism that I admire and aspire to, but I but do too, but don't Wait. exhibit. Wait, it's... here's one of the other pictures on the wall. Yeah, my man. Yeah. That's Gandhi for those of you listening to the audio version. Um, but it's not, it's not based on that. It's totally, it's it's very realist and well, it you don't have to have any kind of beliefs in order to to be convinced by this argument well Except that was the, to be de-intoxicated around the godhood of the nuclear weapon that that was the epiphany i think i had in the library at vanderbilt in nashville is that what i wanted was utility what i wanted was the usefulness of the weapons because we care about usefulness when it comes to technology because technology are tools and we want tools to work. So. Thank you so much. I'm honored. I'm honored that you ran into my friend in an airport. 
<laughs> and that you want to be on the show. This is the best podcast I have been on so far. Um, it has a seriousness of purpose and um, an openness to new ideas that is unique in podcasts. And the notion of 10,000 heroes is so appealing that um, I can't imagine it won't, you know, grow and flourish because it's, it's great stuff. Thank you, Ward. Thank you. Hey, thank you for having me on, you know. So, so what, it, what, what should everyone do? So they should get me on podcasts if they can. Uh, I, I can come out and speak. I'll go anywhere. Uh, sometimes I need some help with the transportation costs, but you know, I, I flew all, all around the world for six years. So, and you're capable of walking 50 miles in a day. Well, not anymore. <laughs> I was a kid then I might do three. Um, <laughs> uh, and they should join realist revolt, which is my organization. And it's a community of people who believe this set of arguments that we need to de I don't know what's the word for de-godding. What what happens when you take oh, God? We know a word for that. Um, deicide. Deicide. Okay, oh, it's called deicide. Okay, well that's what we want. People who are willing to acknowledge that nuclear weapons are a false god that needs to be killed, and um, you know anyone with ideas about how to get me on a TED talk or any get me in front of influencers or whatever. I'm ready. I'm there. I'm, I want to, you know, my, my dream is to have the second edition of the book uh, with a forward by Barack Obama and George W. Bush. They can co-author it together. And Fantastic. Um, Fantastic. that would be, that's because, you know, I want to reach, I want to re reach across the divide. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And that's the whole realist shtick is it doesn't have to be a divide. Yeah. All right. Well, as a closing word of gratitude, I'd like to quote the musical Hamilton. Let's get this guy in front of a crowd. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur. Thank you. Thus concludes another episode of the 10,000 Heroes Show. I'm Ankur Shah Delight. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today. And if you like the show, don't be afraid send me a fat wad of cash. Just kidding. Just kidding. I mean, you can. But really, if you like the show and it made a difference in your life, send it to someone you know and like in the hope that it'll make a positive impact in their life. Because that's what this is all about.